Hello, thanks for joining me today. This is a sermon on John chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. This is the appointed lectionary text for Pentecost 18b. This year that falls on September 26th, 2021. So we begin with our lesson. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. Very truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone is salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ in his one precious Holy Spirit. Amen. Now if you remember, we're a church that follows the Revised Common Lectionary. The lectionary is a three-year cycle of texts that's used as the basis of our worship life and of our preaching. It's used by dozens of denominations around the world, and there's a deep beauty in knowing that both we and our neighbors are sharing in the same lessons Sunday after Sunday, even though tradition and culture and doctrine still sometimes keeps us separate from one another. Each week, there's an assigned series of lessons from the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Gospels, and the Epistles. In pre-COVID times, we would often use at least three of the lessons in our Sunday worship service, but currently with our, with our shorter services, you know, we generally just use the appointed Gospel lesson. So, overall, the discipline of the lectionary is good for us. The lectionary focuses us and forces us to move systematically through the Gospels instead of just continuously rehearsing our favorite passages, our favorite themes. Left to our own devices, we might very well miss whole sections of Jesus' teachings. We might avoid sections that challenge us over much. But there's no perfect system, you understand. Sometimes, to keep lessons to a manageable length, the people who bring us the lectionary will divide lessons and will prevent, uh, present lessons to us in subsequent weeks. Today's lesson is part of last week's lesson. It's a continuation of that lesson. If you missed church last week, please go back, listen to the sermon. At the very least, find your Bible and read Mark 9, starting with verse 30 or so. You can go all the way back to the start of Mark 9. That would be better. But start at verse 30 and read through 37, because it's, it, it's part of today's lesson. It's all part of the same interaction between Jesus and his disciples. So, for our purposes today, let's remember where we were last week. Jesus has been traveling quietly through Galilee with his disciples so he might teach them uninterrupted. During this time, he told them plainly and for the second time that he would soon be betrayed and brutalized and killed and then three days later rise. But they didn't understand him and they were afraid to ask him any questions. So instead of grieving this news that Jesus would be killed or trying to understand it or work up the courage to ask him about what was going on, the disciples fell to arguing among themselves about which one of them was the greatest. Presumably, 
which one of them would take over the movement if and when Jesus' prediction of his death actually came to pass. And Jesus didn't scold them. He didn't send them away for their callousness. Instead, he calls them to himself. He sits among them and he begins to teach them. He told them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child and put it among them and taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Remember now? So Jesus, at the start of our lesson today, is still holding that child in his arms. His words about being the last of all and the servant of all are still echoing in that house in Capernaum. And the immediate conversation prompt for the start of our lesson today is Jesus talking about welcoming people and promising that in welcoming others, one welcomes both he, Christ, and the Father. And it's into that moment that John blurts out that they saw someone outside their little group casting out demons in Jesus' name, and they tried to stop him because, quote, he was not following us, end quote. It's an astonishing moment. I mean, there's some guy out there who has enough confidence in Jesus' teaching that the kingdom of God is at hand, enough confidence that Jesus is an emissary of God, that he's taking on demons, and he's casting them out in Jesus' name. He's caring for broken and vulnerable people. He is doing good. And remember, it was just a few days ago that the disciples were unable to cast a demon out of a little boy who was demon-possessed. But instead of trying to figure out what the new guy is doing and trying to un or trying to understand what it is that's eluding them, they try to shut the new guy down. And did you catch the shift at the end? They're trying to shut him down from casting out demons in Jesus' name because he's not following us. It's not that he's not following Jesus. He's not one of us. They're still in the middle of that same struggle that we've been talking about, trying to figure out who's the greatest. Now it's no longer among themselves that they're trying to figure it out. It's no longer about who's greater among us. It's between themselves and absolutely everyone else. We want to be in charge of who's on the inside. We want to be in charge of who's authorized to act. Pretty much, Jesus, we just want to be in charge. And you can imagine Jesus wanting to hang his head. You can imagine wanting him wanting to weep at the hard-heartedness and the callousness and the persistent lack of understanding. But he doesn't do those things. As always, he goes back to work teaching them. And although our lesson can be divided, it can be used in many different ways, all of which are holy, it's most natural to use it as a four-step, four-part response to the disciples' persistent temptation to compare themselves to one another and to the world. <clears throat> First, Jesus says, regarding the guy casting out demons in my name, don't stop such a person. For no one doing deeds of power in my name will soon be able to speak evil against me. The world is divided, Jesus says. This is a time of struggle. The man that you would restrain is doing the work of my father. He is battling the powers of evil and darkness. Although he's not formally part of your group, he is your ally. And he is by no means my enemy. You guys are so, so short-sighted, so territorial. The world is divided between those who follow me and those who resist me. And don't you know that anyone who gives you the slightest aid or encouragement has in some way chosen my side? Don't you know that the smallest gesture of support will be rewarded? Don't you know that anyone who even gives you a cup of cold water because you follow me will never lose their reward. And second, these little ones, the ones that manage only the smallest support, they're unbelievably precious to me. These cup of cold water followers, or however you want to talk about them, that you would judge and demean are mine. I honor and I treasure their belief in me. 
And if you do anything by word or deed to mess them up, to interfere with their development and growth of their faith, it would be far better for you to have a very large stone tied around your neck and to be thrown into the sea. Third, instead of trying to figure out who's the greatest, instead of trying to figure out who's in and who's out, your time would be much better spent in some holy introspection. There are some things that you want the, to do, things about you that threaten to lead you into ruin. There are some things that you want to grasp that would destroy you. Far better to cut off one of your hands than to continue trying to grasp those things. There are places that you want to go, journeys that you would undertake from which there's no return. It's far better to cut off a foot and enter life lame than to dash headlong into hell. There are ways of looking at the world that lead inexorably to death. Far better to pluck out your eyes and enter life blind than to enjoy perfect vision in hell. And finally, Jesus says, as I've told you before, you're supposed to be the salt of the world. You're a gift to the world. You're here to preserve and protect and to serve. If you lose that, if you give it up, what good are you? Focus on who you're supposed to be and be at peace with one another. <clears throat> if you check, the Bible doesn't record any response from the disciples. But what could they possibly say? What could we possibly say? In this lesson, Jesus clearly lays out the shape of our new lives in his kingdom. We are supposed to rejoice in and celebrate anyone anywhere who is doing a work of healing and provision and peacemaking and care. Though they may be substantially different from us and follow a different path, they should be seen as natural allies and honored for their work. We're supposed to be a people of discipline. Our words matter and our actions matter. We all know people who've been alienated from the church, from Jesus, by the actions of Christian people, Christian leaders, pastors. We all have been guilty at different times of alienating some of the little ones, some of the weak ones, some of the broken ones that need Jesus. And this is a big deal. This is a mighty sin. Thanks be to God that there's forgiveness for us in Jesus. But that forgiveness can never be permission for us to continue those kind of words and those kind of behaviors. If we would be followers of Jesus, we must take him seriously that alienating little ones, the weak ones, is catastrophic. And whatever it costs us, we must stop. We are not free to say whatever we want to say. We are not free to post whatever we want to post. There is no part of our life that's more important than our Christian witness. And everything we do or say is to serve that witness. Third, we are to understand that following Christ will involve sacrifice. There are things that we may not continue to grasp or hold. There are goals that we may not pursue. There are ways of seeing and explaining the world in which we may not indulge. When Jesus says that any who would be his followers must deny themselves, take up their crosses and follow him, he is not speaking poetically. Instead, we are repeatedly informed that this path will involve very real costs. We're always prepared to tell the other person what they need to change, what they need to sacrifice, what they need to do. And Jesus calls us today to focus on ourselves. And unless we have structural responsibility for the other, to leave the other person in peace. There's enough wrong with each one of us to fill all of our time and consume all of our energy. And as Jesus says in another place, we need to stop trying to take the speck out of our neighbor's eye while there's a log in our own. And finally, we're here for a reason. 
Jesus says in different places that we're supposed to be salt and light and leaven in a world that's perishing. If we don't do those things, then we are of no use to the kingdom. One of the purposes of our community, one of the purposes of the church, is to learn and practice these new ways of being. We're not here primarily to be entertained. We're not here to look good or to polish our credentials. We're not called to be the morality police. We're here to learn peace, to practice peace, to be at peace, that we might bring Jesus' peace out into the world. For the next four weeks here in the Tomorrow River Parish, whichever service you attend, you will be attending a confirmation service for one of our 10th graders. You will hear them confess their faith, and when they are asked if they intend to continue in the covenant God made with them in their baptism, they will answer, I will, and I ask God to help and guide me. Perhaps such an answer is the way of holiness for all of us today. So people of God, will you listen to Jesus? Will you work to understand that greatness in the world is a far different thing than greatness in the kingdom of light? Will you aspire to be a welcoming presence? Will you honor all of those who are doing the work of healing and justice and peace? Will you grow in your understandings of your responsibilities? Will you be more disciplined in your words and in your actions, lest people be alienated from Christ and his church? Will you focus on you? Will you embrace the sacrifices incumbent in following Jesus? Will you practice peace? If these are your intentions, I invite you to renew your commitment with those words from our confirmation service. I will, and I ask God to help and guide me. And so now, for those of you who have said those words, may God, who's given you the courage to answer in that way, give you the strength to live in obedience. For the next four weeks, each time a confirmant confirms their faith and affirms their participation in the covenant God made with them in their baptism, an ancient prayer will be prayed over them. A prayer I'd like to pray for you now. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm our faith, guide our lives, empower us in our serving, give us patience in suffering, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Now, we're ready to welcome others into the grace we share. Let the month of confirmation and reformation begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for spending the time with me. May God bless, protect, and keep you. Mm -hmm.